This podcast is being brought to you in part by the veteran-founded Hero Soap Company, located in Phoenix, Arizona. In today's environment, we must be aware of the products we apply to our skin. As a two-time cancer survivor, I cannot afford to take chances, and I use these products myself. The soaps will leave you feeling clean and refreshed. All the products made by the Hero Soap Company are made in the United States with the highest quality ingredients sourced from companies in the United States whenever possible. The products are made in small batches to ensure high quality and contain premium essential oils and fragrance. All Hero Soaps are created without synthetic colorants, parabens, and sulfates that are irritating to the eyes, skin, mouth, and lungs and are cruelty-free, meaning these products are not tested on animals. Each 5-ounce bar of soap is handmade in Phoenix, Arizona, and the body wash is available in 8 ounces with such refreshing scents as the woods, tea tree, lavender, the fields, bourbon, lime, the pines, and arctic. You will absolutely love this soap. Please also check out their gear for sale. All the products are reasonably priced. Being veteran-founded, the company understands the dedication and sacrifice that each family makes to serve their country. A portion of sales is donated back to charities that are focused on helping veterans and our first responders. Over 1,200 bars have been sent to our deployed troops. Please check out their website, HeroSoapCompany.com, for pricing and a detailed description of all the products. When ordering, use the code RAP for a 10% discount. The company information will be listed in the podcast notes and featured on the podcast website, Facebook group, page, and the podcast Instagram. Welcome, everyone. It's a wrap with a wrap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport. Before we start, I would like to thank all of our listeners, supporters, and sponsors that have helped to make this podcast so successful. The podcast is being heard in all 50 states, all provinces of Canada, and over 45 countries around the world. The podcast has been ranked by Feedspot as one of the top 35 overcoming adversity podcasts on the web from thousands in that category, and it's ranked by traffic, social media followers, and content freshness. Please visit the podcast website, it's a wrap with rap.com, uh, for all the episodes to order our logo merchandise, of which a portion of sales profits is donated to various charities and other information regarding the podcast. Now, this podcast features people who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire, motivate, and educate us on an assortment of topics. My guest today is Mike Shalapi. At the age of 14, Mike was involved in a tragic shooting accident, leaving him two-thirds paralyzed. Mike is an author, keynote speaker, four-time Paralympic medalist, two-time world champion in wheelchair basketball. Mike is the only wheelchair basketball player in the United States to be on four consecutive summer Paralympic events and was honored by the state of Utah in 2000 as one of its top 50 athletes of the past century. Mike has been recently inducted into the Wheelchair Basketball Hall of Fame. Hoping to inspire others through his experiences, Mike hung up his sneakers and transitioned from the sports arena to the speaking platform. Mike's thought-provoking story challenges individuals to succeed despite circumstances by empowering themselves and accepting personal responsibility. Off the basketball court, Mike earned a master's degree in business administration and healthcare from Arizona State University and a degree in finance from BYU. Mike is also a writer and author of three popular inspirational books that draw heavily on his own experiences and the challenges he has overcome. Titled Shot Happens, Bulletproof Principles for Personal Success and Motivational Leaders. From one of my favorite cities in America, Salt Lake City, Mike, welcome to the podcast. Ah, thanks, Ron. I appreciate that kind introduction. It's good to be here. Well, it's an honor to have you. 
Mike, uh, you have an incredible story. Tell us about your life growing up in Utah before the accident. Well, life was simple. I grew up in a very small community, uh, 300 people. So we're talking a small town. Yeah. Everybody in this little community respected, supported, trusted each other. And I was just, uh, you know, this, well, I still am this tall, but I was, I was just yay tall. And I would look at those mountains and the Fish Lake Mountains and uh, the, the wide open spaces. And I just was excited about life. And my dad was a basketball coach and I was being primed by my good father to be an exceptional athlete. So I was just an excitable young kid waiting for life to happen. Well, that sounds great. Now, tell us about that fateful day of the accident and your mindset during and after the accident as you were being medically treated. Yeah. Uh, you know, before the accident, I had no idea what the word disabled hardly even meant. I was just going into high school, all focused on girls and sports. And uh, we had a big game the next morning. So I walked down the street to get my buddy. And I remember that day, I, I crossed the road, and I ran across the grass, I jumped on the porch, and I banged on that door, and my friend Tori yelled, come in, Mike, come in. And I walked in that house, Ron, and I, I never walked out. I, I, I couldn't find my friend, so I went down the hallway, and I ended right. up in his mom and dad's bedroom. And I still couldn't find my friend, so I'm thinking about my good mom, my girlfriend, the big game. And then I heard Tori coming down the hallway, and uh I'm sitting in, on the bedspread and he walked in the bedroom holding uh, a gun. So he's holding a gun in a brown leather case. And he stops in front of me very playfully, casually, thinks he takes the bullets out. I watch him laying on the white bedspread. I remember seeing four little silver bullets. So are we talking I, revolver? Yeah, yeah. A little 38 revolver. His dad was a policeman. Oh, so this wow. is his, his off-duty police gun. And uh Thought he took the bullets out and very playfully, casually pulled it up to his hip, pointed it at my chest, bang. And yeah, paralyzed from the waist down. The bullet punctured my lung and clipped my heart and slammed me onto the bedspread. And uh, my friend freaked out and I passed out and I couldn't breathe. And I saw a phone on the wall. And I tried to get to the phone, but I, I was glued to the white bedspread, Ron. I, I couldn't move until I, I just laid there until I died. So I thought, yeah. What 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 was Tori doing at this? Freaking point? out, just in freaking, the kitchen, he, he chucking just, things, and he was uh, what did he um, freeze up? Well, he just, you know, I mean, he yeah. just went in shock as I did immediately, and he just ran in other parts of the house, and I could hear him chucking dishes and pounding on the piano, and. I'm just laying there hoping, hoping for a miracle. Eventually he figured it out and came back in and started shaking me. And I kind of woke up and he saw the hole and pulling my chest. And he ran over the phone that I couldn't get to. And he called, he called my mom. He didn't call 911. He called he didn't call 911. All right. Yeah. I called my mom. And mom called 911, I take it. Yeah. Mom showed up. Moms matter. If there's any moms out there, you matter. Yeah, for sure. You know, when he when he shot you in the chest, it's surprising you just, you know, you, you didn't really die. You know, I mean, what what saved you? Well, when I when I got to the hospital, they took x-rays. Yeah. The bullet nicked my heart. But my heart, when I got shot, was on an inbeat. If it would have been on an outbeat. I wouldn't be on your awesome podcast. So happy. Let me take a very brief moment out to alert all our patients and caregivers out there that Rare Patient Voice, a supporter of the podcast, is paying for your input. Patients 16 years and older and caregivers, family, and friends of any disability, disorder, syndrome, illness, or condition have the opportunity to express their opinions through surveys and interviews to improve medical products and services. Who knows your journey better than you? Rare Patient Voice puts you in touch with researchers who are developing products and services that can help you and others with your condition. These researchers need input of patients to develop products and services that have significant impact on patients' lives. Over the past nine years, Rare Patient Voice has paid patients over $10 million. When you join Rare Patient Voice, you may be invited to participate in interviews, surveys, or online communities where you will share your insights. 
Rare Patient Voice usually has hundreds of studies running at any time, so there are many opportunities to participate. You will earn $120 per hour for participating in these studies. By making your voice heard, you are a catalyst for change. Rest assured, your input will be used to help other patients like you. There is no cost at all to you, the participant. You can get more information and sign up by clicking the link in the sponsor's notes. It can make a whole lot of difference. I am thankful to be alive. Wow. Wow. That's a miracle. That is a miracle. So, Mike, you're in the hospital uh, for five months and you're getting therapy. And you gave you 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 say you gave yourself the best therapy, which you termed attitude therapy. Tell us tell us about that. Well, for me, it was getting my head in the right place. You know, I watched my legs shrink, and I went to therapy and all the stuff. Got in a wheelchair, figured out how to dress myself, and that was all hard. But the hardest part was just me getting my head in the right place, and uh, I had to change. In our lives, if we resist change, we fail. Yeah. If we accept change, we survive. If we create change, we succeed. And I had to change. I had to be willing to do something different. But right at first, it was just a matter of survival and, you know, anger and mad at God and why me and why me? And, you know, so I just I went through the emotions. But this attitude therapy, these heavy doses of trying to count my blessings and focus on what I had left and instead of what I'd lost, that, that was an important thing for me. So when you did the attitude therapy, which you did yourself, right? Did you have any other uh, help along the way? Were there any people that intervened and came to see you and, you know, gave you any advice, pep talk, whatever? Is there anybody? Oh, oh absolutely. My friends would pack the elevators and I'd smile and they'd go home and then I'd go rock bottom a little bit. My parents were always there, my family, and uh, even people in wheelchairs. A guy, a double amputee showed up and talked about playing wheelchair basketball on a team. And I'm like, wow, you drove here. And wow, you're married. And wow, you have a job. And so Mike Johnson was his name. And he kind of became a mentor to me. If he can do it, I can do it. So one of the, yeah, it was, he was my mentor. You also have a, I think your mom gave you a little bit of a model to can you tell us what that was? Yeah, I went home and, uh, you know, it's hard. Uh, I no longer had all the nurses, but my 11-year-old sister, Julie, became my private nurse. My dad and I'd go out in the backyard and shoot baskets. And my first shot fell five feet short. Right. And I was a good basketball player. And all of a sudden, I was bummed out. And uh, my dad said, Mike, you can still be a great athlete. You're just going to have to do it differently. And then my mom, we were doing dishes one day and she, uh, she would cry and I would dry the dishes and she stopped and looked at me, Mike, just because you can't stand up doesn't mean you can't stand out. And that meant everything to me that became my life motto. I sit here in front of you or Ron or those are listening in. And I used to be able to do 10,000 things. Now I can only do 9,900. So I just tried to move forward. Hey, by the way, it's okay to have a bad day. Yeah. Especially if you've been shot. But right. we have to try not to let bad days turn into bad weeks, bad months. Because that's when you get in a deeper hole. And so I'm not here to make anybody feel guilty or anything. I, I'm just kind of sharing what I, I went through and some of these positive thoughts and, and poems and books. All that kind of helped me stay level. Yeah, uh, I uh, I went through uh, male breast cancer twice and lymphedema. I'm still struggling with that. And like you said, it's easy to go down that rabbit hole and feel, but you're you're going to have a bad day or maybe let's call it uh, a, some bad moments. You're human, you know. I mean, it's a roller coaster. But the thing I always tell myself is when you get down, okay, fine. You know, it, it's cathartic to have it, but you got to move on after that. You oh, just absolutely. can't, you can't dwell on it. And that's what, right. and do you agree just for the people out there listening? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can always, you can always look in the rear view mirror and learn, 
And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that, but ultimately right. you got to look out the the front window and you got to kind of work with what's ahead of you. I mean, I had to figure things out. This was not a world that I knew. And there's a whole lot more to being in a wheelchair than just pushing from point A to point B. But I don't care if you're in a wheelchair or you just have a headache or some depression or whatever people are going through. If we live in a world of fault and blame and shame and all those things, it's just hard to heal. And I, I think we have to go through the, those emotions, but I, I think it's dangerous if, it's, if we stay in them for too many days and too many weeks. Right. Ab absolutely. Now, your dad, you said, was, was priming you to be a basketball player. Tell us uh, how, once, once you learned about wheelchair basketball, how did it change you? Well, that was my identity. Uh, you know, you probably see me rolling around. You probably can't see I'm in a chair here, but my identity was my legs. And when they didn't work, I couldn't be an athlete in my mind. And so I kind of just lost who I was. And when wheelchair sports and basketball and marathons and tennis, when that was introduced to me, it was a uh, very uh, healing for me to still be able to compete, to share my talents just locally at first and to, to play the same game, 10 foot baskets, and you still have to dribble and special chairs. And so it just became a part of my world that helped me heal. And all of this is happening when you're what, 14, 15 years old? Yeah, I turned 15 in the hospital. So I got a, I got a wheelchair for my 15th birthday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I don't know. Would you say that's easier or harder when you're, when you're younger or older? Is, I don't know. You know that's a me. good question for everybody out there. Would you rather be shot and paralyzed or whatever when you're 15 or when you're 50? <laughs> I really, I really don't know. But for me, I was thankful I had some of those younger experiences of uh, playing on the playground or developing my coordination, you know, so I, I'm glad that I had some life experience not in a wheelchair for me personally. Yeah. Oh, sure. Mike, how hard was it for you to get in shape to play wheelchair basketball? I mean, you're two thirds paralyzed. I don't know, was your upper body strength obviously must have been affected from the shooting. Yeah. So, you know, that bullet hit my spine. So I'm paralyzed, you know, from the chest down, there's no movement. I'm completely paralyzed. So my legs shrunk and atrophied and, uh, but my shoulders started to get strong and my arms and I would train and play basketball and run marathons and, and just transferring and lifting and climbing, you know, I just gradually became stronger in the shoulders. Now, I've been in a chair almost, you know, 45 years. So I am declining a little bit, but yeah, I, I kind of developed a strong upper body to play sports. Yeah. Things compensate, you know, it's kind of like you lose yeah. something and you gain something else. And so I just had to gain stronger shoulders. So when did you let things go about the accident and forgive uh, your friend, Troy, who shot you and did Troy forgive himself and what eventually happened to Troy? Well, so yeah, Tori, uh, Tori, um, is it Tori? I, I thought it was yeah, Tori. Tori. That's, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So the rest of the Tori with Tori was, uh, we hung out, we were neighbors, friends, teammates. It was awkward. We'd go to the mall and people might come up and say, Hey Mike, what happened to you? <laughs> he shot me, you know, kind of yeah. awkward, Yeah. but he moved away and he went rock bottom and he started getting in trouble, robbing banks. He ended up in prison for many years. Oh, wow. But I always wanted to reconnect with Tori, and uh, I did. He got out of prison, and he met me at a restaurant, and he knelt down. We embraced. We chatted. And, you know, it, it's, it's a situation we both went through. This, this didn't just happen to me. But if you saw us standing together, you'd think it all happened to me. But some disabilities and challenges, as we all know, are more apparent to those around us. And sometimes that's good. And Sometimes it's bad, but I don't hide my disability. I, I readily, if the chance happens, I readily let people know why I'm, I'm in a wheelchair. I think that's important. Just curious, but how many people come up to you? And, and the reason I'm asking this is, uh, as you can see, I'm wearing like all these wraps on my arm and people come up to me. I don't even know who they are. I'm at Walmart or wherever. 
what happened to you? What happened to you? <laughs> What's your problem? <laughs> yeah. Is the same thing happen to you? Yeah. You know, some people run, you know, but it's a lot, a lot better than it was 40 years ago. Kids now aren't scared of me. You know, every once in a while, hey, dad, there's a rolling man or or they're curious. I don't I don't think people look at me because they're disrespecting me. I try to no, bury no. myself like but I think people are curious, just like I might look at a seven foot tall guy. People look at me, maybe glance at me. But I I hope I don't try to think they're having all these negative thoughts. I think, you know, a lot of times we think we know what other people are thinking about us. I think people have the ability to more be more empathetic and understanding. Yeah. We just need to have that dialogue and that communication. Right. So when did you let things go about that accident and forgive them? Because I know you probably didn't forgive them immediately. But how long did that take? You know, it, it was a little bit of a process. I broke my arm, Ron, a year later. And so now I'm back in the hospital getting surgery. And I got four limbs and only this one worked. Wow. Yeah. I went in circles for five months. But when they did surgery in the hospital, they flipped me over. They sliced open my back. They took that bullet out. I held it in my hand and I started shaking. That little bullet symbolized so much loss and heartache in my young life. But it's about the time in my life I let it go. I got the let out, so to speak. I completely let it, let it go. I forgave my friend. And I've not, I've taken responsibility. I don't blame him. It was an accident. I, I went in the house. I was on the football team. I walked in the bedroom. So it just happened. And uh, I, I just have never lived in that world of blame about him hardly ever, maybe never. That's good. I yeah. hope that's yeah. healthy. I, you know, I, I think that's the healthy way to go, obviously. Yeah, I do. Now, you talk about taking personal responsibility. Tell our audience about your thoughts about that. Well, um, I learned about that when I was water skiing right after my accident. I'd got that cast off my arm and I was water skiing and I'm laying on this brown, ugly, yellow wooden board. My dad's driving water, hit me in the face and everybody on the shore is staring at me and everybody in the boat's laughing because my legs are flapping around. I look like an injured frog. <laughs> well, I knew something was wrong and I looked over my shoulder and my legs were flapping around, but there was a worse problem. The water that came under that yellow board had ripped off my swimming trunks. <laughs> and I was mortified. And so I quickly fall off. I'm bobbing up and down. I know, I know the boat will come back and get me. And I'm having these thoughts. Like, it's not my fault. I lost my swimming trunks. It's not my fault. I, I'm up to here in cold water. It's not my fault. I got shot. And then my thoughts came full circle. It's not about fault and blame. It's about personal responsibility. Three important words. Take personal responsibility. Maybe that's actually four words. Take personal response ability. We cannot always help in our lives what happens, but we always have the chance to respond. How are we going to react? Yes, Tori shot me. Yes, he, he pointed the gun at my chest and he paralyzed me, almost killed me. But when I take responsibility for my part, it empowers me to live my life and, and not always be pulling an anchor behind me. And, and I'm just telling my story. I recognize those of you that are out there. I, I, I recognize we all have different things. And so I do love you. I do care about you. And I, I hope through our conversation that maybe I can give you some little trick. And we do need others. We do need help. But personally, we can also work on the way that we think and react and, and not place too much blame because then it, it takes the power away from us and lay, lays it on somebody else. Well said. So you set a goal when you turned 16 to represent the United States. 1980, yeah, 1988 rolls around and the summer games are in Seoul, South Korea. You're the youngest, the youngest man to make that, to make the team. Tell us about that experience. Well, you can only imagine, I was laying in a hospital bed 10 years earlier, didn't even know I'd ever play sports, and now I'm representing my country. Right. And so just the thought of that and putting on the red, white, and blue was just, the Olympics was exhilarating. But to get over there, to compete, to win, to win. Are you worried about damaging your hearing? 
Have you experienced any mental fog or a decrease in your memory as of late? Is the thought of having to rely on a hearing aid frightening to you? Well, I have good news for you. You can take steps to protect your ears from damage starting today. Cortexy formula works to shield your ears using only research-backed, all-natural ingredients combined in the precise ratios required to support healthy hearing. Cortexy is a natural formula consisting of plant ingredients, non-GMO, easy to swallow, contains no stimulants, and is not habit-forming. Inside every drop, you will find over 20 carefully selected ingredients that support healthy hearing, protects the ear, improves blood flow to the ear, and supports clear sounds and boosts your energy. Cortexy has provided amazing hearing support for men and women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 70s. It is manufactured in the United States in a state-of-the-art, FDA-registered, and GMP-certified facility. Experience for yourself the joys of hearing your loved ones clearly and the sound of your favorite songs. Reduce noise and interference, increase mental sharpness, and stronger ability to form memories. Cortexy comes with a 100% money-back guarantee, 60 full days from your original purchase. If you are not totally and completely satisfied with the product or your results within the first 60 days, simply call the toll-free number or send an email and Cortexy will gladly give you a full refund within 48 hours of the product being returned, minus shipping and handling fees. A link providing detailed product and ordering information will be listed in the podcast notes. The gold medal, the flags raised, the national anthem, they, they put those gold medals around our neck. In fact, I got them out of my safe. So I'm going to show you. Okay. For oh. those that are watching this on YouTube, Mike's going to show us the, the yeah, medal. There's, there's the gold, gold medal. medal. Yep. I'm crying as it was put around my neck and I took it home and shared it with my mom. My mom liked it so much. She wanted to bronze it. <laughs> so, so that that's 1988 and that's yep. Seoul, South Korea. Yep. And you, we won the gold medal. Wow. That, that that's fantastic. So that's 1988. Tell us about 1992, Barcelona, Spain. So in Barcelona, Spain, I made the team again. Uh, excited again. Personal motto: No pain. No Spain. Uh, got over there. Again, we beat Holland. Again, they played the national anthem. Again, they put a gold medal around our necks. I don't have it anymore, Ron. I lost it. I you lost, lost it. the gold medal. How did I lose it? How is that possible? Uh, well, one of my teammates tested positive for drugs. And I had to give uh, it back. Oh, wow. Don't feel bad for me. I just want us all to know everything we do affects everybody else on the team. So... We won a gold medal, but we lost it. But a lot of lessons learned and, and you know, just more of what we talked about here this evening. So what happens in the record books? I mean, do you just get deleted from uh, um, from the winner's well, circle? Yeah, we kind of get pushed out and they ask for our medals back and we turn them in. And uh, a few people didn't turn them in and they could never play again. And so it was a big deal. I don't want to get into all the stuff. But the bottom line is, yeah, the United States of America won the gold but then was stripped of our gold medal so does the silver winner yeah, so everybody just moves up move up so second goes gold and third goes silver and bronze up to your fourth place up to up to bronze okay okay so that's how that works all right okay so you make two teams now you're going for another one we got 1996 <clears throat> i was actually there Oh, Atlanta, oh. Georgia. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. Tell us about that one. Well, that one was in our country here in the U.S. And I'm getting a little older at that point. I have a kid. Uh, so I got a family and working and being a little more adult and responsible. But I made the team and down there, you know, trying to uh, get our gold medal back. Right. And we're playing in front of 15,000 people. It's the best team ever put together. And we got beat. And we didn't know how to handle adversity. We didn't know how to handle adversity. We never lost. You don't find out about yourself when the sun is always shining. Right. So everybody's heading the locker room. Coach is mad. Coach is yelling. Coach is chucking wheelchairs. Some of us <laughs> were still even in those wheelchairs. 
But we got knocked down and we got up and we won the bronze medal. So we won a bronze in uh, in Atlanta. Who, who beat you in Atlanta? Oh, uh, Australia beat us. And then we ended up beating Spain for the bronze. Okay. So you still walked out of there with them. And, and your oh. mother, your mother got her bronze medal. Yeah. My mom didn't have to bronze it. Yeah. Yeah. That's you right. know, third place in the world of 7 billion people. That's not too bad or 8 That's... billion, whatever there is now. Yeah. Right. So we started out in 1988. So Korea, 12 years later, you're the oldest guy to make the team. We're talking Sydney, Australia. Tell us about that one. Well, that one was down in a beautiful country. Now I'm even a little older and now I got another child and we're down there trying to get our gold medal back. And I knew it was the end. I, I knew this was my, so my family's there we're playing in these beautiful arenas and lots of people and we're looking forward to getting our gold medal back and some of our Canadian friends Canada beat us again and we got beat and everybody's heading the locker room coaches mad but I sat in the middle of that court for five minutes I looked at the flags the athletes I reflected I remember what a privilege it had been to represent my country over the course of 12 years in what I believe is the greatest sporting event in the world. And, and we got up the next night and we hit a 25 footer at the buzzer to win the bronze. And I have it with me. So okay. here's our bronze from uh, Sydney, Australia. 2000. Beautiful there's bronze. The Beautiful. Metal. Yeah. There's the Sydney uh, bridge right there. The opera house. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. So I like to say Michael, Michael Phelps doesn't even have any of these so i got a gold and i got a i got a bronze yep did did you uh by chance get to do the bridge oh, i did wow yeah i even went down all those stairs at the opera house and yeah just enjoyed sydney australia yeah it's a great place well there's a saying you're saying the greater the obstacle the more glory overcoming it Tell us some of the obstacles you have done being in that wheelchair. Well, there's the physical obstacles, you know, just the things we've been talking about, trying to get out and live life, and date and get married and drive cars and get degrees at colleges. There's all that. But there's the lessons. Um, I feel as if I maybe have come full circle. And how do I know that? I think the fact that I can sit on here and comfortably share my story with a desire to help your good people tells me that I probably have completely accepted my disability. I hope so. And I've learned in my life through all these physical things and mental things. And, you know, there's just so many hard things that everybody goes through in life. Right. But I've learned that when we feel pain, we change. And when we change, we grow. And when we grow, we discover the beauty that lies within each and every one of us. And I, I showed you these medals, but I have one other item. Okay. And this item, well, there's the book you've alluded to. Shot happens. Shot happens. I got <laughs> shot. What's your problem? But what I want to share with your audience or tell or whoever's listening or watching, this is my bullet. Wow. At the end of that lanyard, that little thing spent two years in my spine and it created a lot of pain, closed a lot of doors, opened a few others. But tonight isn't about me. I'd like to ask every one of us out there, if you would be willing to find your bullet. What stops you? What, what paralyzes you? It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you're an idiot. It doesn't mean you're a loser. It means you're self-aware aware and willing to take the good with the bad. And, and there is a lot of D words that do make life difficult. Divorce, death, disease, doubt, diabetes, all these D words, in-laws, yeah, Dallas Cowboys. Anyway, so <laughs> find your bullet yeah. and uh, sleep good tonight. The podcast is so happy and proud to have Blue Sky CBD as one of our sponsors and supporters. At Blue Sky CBD, they know that the highest quality CBD starts from the seed. 
Blue Sky partners with sustainable, responsible farms for superior hemp plants to extract their CBD and other healthful phytonutrients. Each of Blue Sky's products contain high concentrations of CBD for maximum impact, and Blue Sky offers some of the lowest cost per milligram CBD on the market. All Blue Sky's products are THC-free and are tested by a third-party laboratory for potency and purity. All this has made Blue Sky one of the only brands trusted by healthcare professionals across the United States. As the demand for CBD and its therapeutic potential have grown rapidly worldwide, it's difficult to know which products you can trust. At Blue Sky CBD, they don't just sell their products, they use their products. Blue Sky CBD proudly shares testimonials of their loved ones who use these products. Blue Sky CBD guarantees the potency and purity of each and every product they sell. Blue Sky tests their products three times. First, the plant is tested, next the isolate, and last, the final product to ensure each product batch meets Blue Sky's high standards. A copy of the Certificate of Analysis is linked below each product description online. The Blue Sky CBD website contains client testimonials, including a case study for each testimonial from people just like you regarding people dealing with severe anxiety and insomnia, high blood pressure, pain management, headache, rheumatoid arthritis and spondylitis, and endocrine balance. Blue Sky even makes the product pet love for our canine and feline family members. There is some confusion between medical marijuana, CBDs that contain THC, and the THC-free hemp CBDs within states. Blue Sky CBD uses CBD derived from hemp that is THC-free, which is drug-free and can be sold everywhere legally. Blue Sky CBD wants you to feel confident with your purchase and offers you excellent customer service. If you are not satisfied with their products, you may request a refund of the full purchase price within 30 days of the product received date. When ordering, please use the podcast link to receive 20% off your initial purchase. The link and website information will be listed in the podcast notes. Because everybody matters. And uh, we know our problems but we got to focus on all of our goodness that goes along with our bullets. Well, I guess it kind of leads into the next question. What, what was the greatest lesson you have learned in life and from who? Well, I think the greatest lesson I learned is, well, that, you know, that motto from my mom, but my dad really kicked my butt after my accident. And that may sound mean to a, a newly disabled kid and, I didn't mean he literally kicked my butt. If he did, I wouldn't feel it anyway, but I had to do my chores and I had to figure out how to go water skiing and snowmobiling. And I had to figure out how to deal with physical pain and nerve pain. And I became tough and I learned that I could do hard things. And some of us can push ourselves. Others need others to kick our butts and move forward. But that's maybe the greatest lesson I learned is we just can't be stuck in the mire of mediocrity we've got to keep pushing forward to that next challenge and we will fail many times along the way but as we move forward and then we look in that rearview mirror there is lessons and blessings to be learned just from the beauty of life so i i would say just move forward just learn and move forward and just keep moving forward yeah you get you get pushed down just get back up yeah you're back up on that horse. Yeah. Have you, Mike, have you used your platform uh, to advocate for safe firearm handling and storage? And if not, uh, do you intend to at some point? You know, I have a little bit. I am obviously an example of what a gun can do, uh, what carelessness can do. Um, I, I'm, I'm well aware of that. I I have many friends that have been shot. However, growing up the way I grew up in Utah and the Rocky Mountains and the way I knew guns for hunting pheasants or deer, it was a different mentality. So I am not a gun hater. I am, I'm not somebody that goes around and say, you know, don't ever touch a gun, but I'm very nervous around guns. I'm, I'm very aware sure. of the damage they can do. So I try to be a little bit careful with getting too one side or the other, because I really am fairly 
centered on that subject. I, I can see both sides. Okay. For those out there struggling with life challenges, what last words do you have for them? That I don't understand everything you're going through, but I believe in you. And I believe you're stronger than you think you are. And I believe there is help. And I believe we have to meet in the middle. I went to a school dance. I sat in the corner, wouldn't dance. A girl walked across the gym and asked me to dance. And I said, yes. And I went out there and we danced and it was weird. And then she went back to her corner and I went back to my dark, safe corner. But we have to meet people in the middle. If we just suffer in silence in our little corner, sometimes that's very difficult. So weaknesses and challenge and disabilities, they don't say that we're bad or dumb or anything. We just need to work with other people to try to overcome these challenges. And so I just admire you. I respect you for even being on this podcast, even listening to my story and maybe gaining one small thing that will help you. And so I don't even know who I'm talking to, but I respect all of you and thank you. That, uh, that dance left a, a very big impression on you. Absolutely. You're never going to forget that, are you? No, I got the slow dance in a wheelchair and it was worth it. Yeah. Mike, how can people contact you? If they want to contact you. Uh, I have a website, mikeshalapi.com. Um, you know, you can go on there and there's like a, you can contact me or there's a products page or I'm in Draper, Utah. I'm, I'm happy to help. However, I, I can, you know, I speak all over the world and things like that. So if you ever have a meetings or whatever, and you need a good speaker, then give me a buzz. But yeah. So Happy to help however I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to have that contact information uh, in the podcast notes. I want to thank you, Mike, for being on the podcast. You are an inspiration to all of us listening. And I wish you good health and happiness going forward. Thank you so much for being on and sharing your story with us. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for all the good you do. Well, thank you very much. Comments and suggestions uh, out there for the podcast, you can email me at it's a wrap with rap at gmail.com. Our website is it's a wrap with rap.com. We have a Facebook group uh, that's in the thousands right now. You're welcome to join it's a wrap with rap. Uh, Instagram, it's a wrap with rap podcast. And of course, all the episodes are, are, are on YouTube. It's a wrap with rap, the podcast uncut. I want to thank everyone for listening. Please stay safe. And for now, it's a wrap.